Hi, welcome to our video series on caring for patients with infectious respiratory diseases. In this one, we're going to look at one of the diagnostic tests for SARS-CoV-2. We're going to look at how you do the swab, whether it's the nasal cavity or in the mouth. Now, I started with this picture just so you're clear on what, we talk, what we're talking about. The swab is what you see being held in that blue gloved hand. And in this picture, they're inserting it in the nasal cavity. Now you can either do it in the nasal cavity or in the mouth. So let's talk about this swab first. It's a thin, sterile testing tool. It's actually less than three millimeters in diameter at the tip. Now the swab is placed at the back of the nasal passage where it connects to the throat via the nasopharynx. Now the swab, you gotta keep it there for a few seconds so it can really absorb the secretions. Then the swab is carefully placed into a liquid filled tube for transport. Now here's why it's important that we're doing this video series, because there is a risk of a false negative if the sample isn't taken correctly. So as a healthcare member of the team, you want to make sure that you know how to do this correctly. So let's go over the three most important steps for a nasopharyngeal swab. You insert the swab into the nostril parallel to the palate. Then you just carefully slide it forward until you feel a soft resistance. Don't force this. That's not what you want to be doing for the patient's safety. Now the swab should be about equal to the depth of from the nostrils to the outer opening of the ear. Now that's where you leave it in there and rotate it around for several seconds because the goal is you want to absorb all those secretions. Then you're going to slowly remove the swab. Keep in mind, be patient. This is not comfortable for the patient. Some people, this will be just unbearable for them. They just have a thing about it and other patients won't even hardly act like it bothers them. But be patient in either instance. So this is the steps for the nasopharyngeal swab. You can also take an oropharyngeal swab. Now you'll notice you've got the two blue gloved hands there. You've got a tongue depressor, that's what's holding down the tongue, and you're shooting for the posterior pharyngeal wall. You can see you've got that little circle around the swab. That's to remind you that it needs to stay there for a little bit so it can absorb those secretions. So let's look at the three steps for an oral pharyngeal swab. You're going to insert the swab into the oral cavity and be careful that you don't touch the gums, the teeth, or the tongue. That's why a tongue depressor is a good idea. You want to swab the posterior pharyngeal wall using a rotary motion. Make sure you've got those substances absorbed. Now, whether you took it from the nasal cavity or an oral pharyngeal swab, let's look at the next step. After you've collected the specimen on the swab, then you're going to put it immediately into sterile tubes that have two to three milliliters of this transport media. Now, if you've collected one of each, one from their nose, one from their mouth, then they should both be combined into a single vial. So that's step one, you collected it. Step two, you put the swabs immediately into the vial. Now you'll see in our picture, there's a score line right there that's on the tools on the swabs that you collected. You want to carefully leverage the swab against the tube rim to break the shaft right at the scored line. Last step, carefully cover the tube with the appropriate cap. That's it. That's all there is to correctly collecting and storing that specimen. Now, if it's going to be there for a little while, you want to know, make sure it's stored at a specimen of two to eight degrees Celsius for up to 72 hours after it's been collected. If you're not going to be able to test it or ship it before then, then you have to store it at a negative 70 degrees Celsius or below. Be careful to note that you only use synthetic fiber swabs with plastic shafts. If you have a calcium alginate swab or a swab with wooden shafts, those may inactivate the virus and really mess up the PCR testing. So make sure you have the right kind of swab. That's been part of the problem when there's been a shortage of PCR testings. There haven't been enough swabs or enough of the specimen collections to put them in. Now the World Health Organization and CDC both use reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reactions or RT-PCR. Well, I did not do a good job saying that, but you see it right there on the screen. This is what a spokesperson for the FDA has said. 
Based on what is known about the pathophysiology of COVID-19, the data provided and our previous experience with respiratory pathogen tests, the false positive rate for authorized tests is likely to be very low and the true positive rate is likely to be high. Now, when she said authorized test, you may have heard in the news at some point that people were making home kits you'd be able to buy for just under $200. Those were not approved and were removed from the market. Now, the turnaround time for these tests can be from days to an hour. And what happened? How did they speed that up so quickly? Well, most of the tests took a few days up to a few hours. And before March 2020, when we were in such a crisis, the FDA stepped in and granted emergency youth authorization or EUA. So now there are available rapid diagnostic PCR tests that the manufacturers say can deliver results in less than an hour. Phenomenally better going from turnaround time being days to now, it is an hour or less. So here you have all these pieces together. We left this slide in here to remind you how you collect and how you send the sample to the lab plays a critically role in us getting accurate results. So take your time, read the directions of each collection kit that you have carefully, and make sure you follow the steps to the T. Thank you for watching this video with us today.